He um, is a trustee of Princeton University and Johns Hopkins University and would seem to offer us an academic perspective from that. Uh, he is chairman of the American Red Cross and president of the Boy Scouts of America, so he has credentials as a humanitarian and uh, community leader. He's a former uh, <coughs> undersecretary of the Army, and he knows something about uh, government service. And reading his biographical information, there seems to be scarcely a point on the globe that, he ha that his feet haven't touched. Now, his feet may have been in swim fins, or in the basket of a balloon, uh, or on a, the deck of a tall ship, or in hiking boots, uh, but he's certainly got around, so he is uh, adventurous, if not an adventurer. So I'm very much looking forward to the, the pan panoramic view that uh, Mr. Augustine should be able to offer us in our subject tonight, which is the world that came in from the cold, implication for the post-war economies of the United States and the former Soviet Union. Please join me in welcoming Norman Augustine. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the only very important part you left out was you didn't plug my book, and that's <laughs> always a... If any of you happen to have a copy of my book, I certainly would want to congratulate you on being a member of a very select small group. <laughs> In fact, somebody told me the other day that one of the greatest collector's items in the decade ahead will be unsigned copies of my book. <laughs> it's uh, my favorite book that I wrote uh, is uh, a book of laws about business. And uh, I received a letter from Lawrence Peter, you know, the Peter Principle, which it's one of my most valued possessions. And uh, in the letter, he said I had undermined his entire life's work. That uh, <laughs> said I had risen not one, but two levels above my level of competence. <laughs> and the book has gotten me into a good deal of trouble over the years, uh, particularly with some of our company's major customers. Uh, the recent chief of staff of the Army, Carl Vono, who of course would be the top general in the U.S. Army, was speaking one evening and he said he'd been reading my book and he didn't think very much of it. And uh, he went on to say that he particularly didn't like the law that I had endorsed that said that uh, rank times IQ is a constant. <laughs> and, uh, I can't believe I did that. So I've now moved away from business into more general laws. My most recent law I'll share with you states the following. It states that uh, uh, tornadoes are caused by trailer parks. <laughs> I, I have indisputable evidence of that fact. It's a, a great privilege to be here in, in your wonderful city, uh, which is just done such marvelous things in the past decades. Uh, it's a city that, of course, means a, a, a special amount to our company, uh, given the early history uh, that we shared with you and, of course, the fact that we have a, a, a major factory and a world-class uh, research laboratory here. The, uh, the famous China Clippers that our company built were built here and uh, helped lead the way into a whole new era of commercial air travel. And today we're doing some very exciting things uh, here as well. And in fact, uh, very often when you fly on a commercial airliner, you will fly uh, with a, uh, a thrust reverser that was built uh, here in Baltimore by our company. Uh, and as was mentioned in the kind introduction, I do have the great honor and privilege of serving on Johns Hopkins Board of Trustees, which I, I've enjoyed very much. Now, I thought this evening uh, I would talk a bit uh, about the subject of defense conversion. And I realize that as a before dinner topic that stirs up an excitement level that ranks probably slightly ahead of reading the Congressional Register, but uh, <laughs> certainly well behind the, uh, uh, the Federal Register. Uh, but it's a topic that I think is very important. And uh, you may say, uh, why should you care about what's happening to the defense industry 
And I would like to suggest several answers. Uh, one answer to that question is that until recently, that's an industry that provided jobs to uh, three and a half million of your fellow citizens. And uh, well over a million and a half of those uh, citizens are now in the process of losing their jobs. And in fact, uh, my most recent calculation is that the millionth person will leave our industry uh, on about the 4th of July of this year. And each of those took with them about another two and a half jobs. So there's certainly been a, a major impact on our economy and will be further impact on our economy by the uh, conversion or shifting in defense priorities. Uh, another reason I would suggest you might choose to be interested would be that ours is an industry that uh, I think has brought great pride to our nation uh, in many fields. As for example, it placed a dozen Americans on the moon and brought them safely back to Earth. It uh, helped trigger the modern electronics revolution and built the uh, electronic digital computer uh, uh, field. It's an industry that's pioneered the world air transportation system, and uh, that's a system, of course, where uh, a population equal to the size of Detroit climbs aboard a commercial airliner somewhere in America every day and flies it. And we just recently passed the milestone where a billion people had flown uh, uh, scheduled commercial airliners without a single fatality, which is uh, a record uh, almost unimaginable uh, in the past. Uh, more recently, uh, our industry has made possible a revolutionary way to navigate and locate uh, uh, airplanes and ships and people and baggage and rail cars that uh, I think will revolutionize uh, anything that has to do with position locating. But then, of course, there's the uh, more important, or most important, let me say, uh, I think contribution of our industry, and that has to do with uh, helping assure the nation's security and helping assure the freedom of the people throughout the world. And uh, again, the last, I think, is by far the most important. And it, unfortunately, it does seem that today, for every success story, such as the one we are seeing in South Africa, there seems also to be a North Korean nightmare, or a Yemeni conflict, or a Rwandan civil war, or another uh, blemish of those types. Uh, Furthermore, defense conversion, I think, is important to all of us uh, because it's something having a profound impact in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. Uh, in the former Soviet Union, uh, defense spending represented about a fourth of their gross domestic product. Uh, that's about twice what we believed it was during the Cold War. And uh, that compares, for example, in the U.S., where it typically was 7 or 8 percent, and today is around 4 percent. And so, Whereas defense conversion is important in America, uh, it's uh, critical in the future of the countries that made up the Soviet Union. And uh, whether those nations can remain on their recent more progressive course, I think will depend a lot on how well they do at defense conversion. And should they not succeed, uh, we could find them endorsing some other unthinkable political alternative, uh, most likely, in my opinion, either fascism or, uh, or, uh, or, or anarchy. So uh, it's probably not an overstatement to say that with regard to the former Soviet Union, that as defense conversion goes, so will go their economies. And as their economies go, uh, so likely will go their experiment with democracy. And as their experiment with democracy goes, so likely will go world stability. Uh, this summer, uh, a once proud Soviet army is now taking on one of the major withdrawals in history and one of the most complicated and actually least appreciated, perhaps, withdrawals in history. Uh, desertions have dram dramatically thinned the forces of that army. Today, where the officer corps is almost equal in size to the number of soldiers they command, pay is very poor and living conditions are worse. Uh, and yet the withdrawal seems to be progressing. On the other hand, one probably can't be too cautious in assessing the status of the former Soviet Union, the republics that made it up. As uh, 
Churchill, of course, reminded us more than 50 years ago about uh, his inability to forecast the actions of Russia and his comments about it being a, a mystery, uh, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an, ig an enigma. Uh, I've always been intrigued and I think in informed by the remark that uh, was going around in, in, in uh, the Soviet Union some years ago uh, where the citizens uh, being subjected to constantly rewritten history to reflect current uh, political doctrine uh, had a saying that said, uh, in Russia, it's almost impossible to predict the past. <laughs> uh, and if it's that difficult to predict the past, of course, you can imagine, uh, or I can only imagine what it might be to predict the future. Uh, so that's the reason why I think perhaps we should be interested uh, in defense conversion in Russia in addition to in the United States. Turning to the United States, uh, our industry, the arsenal of democracy or the military industrial complex as one might choose to re reflect it, uh, its situation is probably well characterized by the opening lines in the tale of two cities. Uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And at the very moment when the defense industry shares uh, with all humanity the successful end of the Cold War, and on the heels of the great victory that our industry helped secure in the Persian Gulf, our industry finds itself not simply in free fall, uh, but in something that's probably more akin to a power dive. And uh, the expected triumphant victory procession for most of our employees, or many of our employees, has instead turned out to be a march to the unemployment office, where one person in our industry is losing their job every 30 seconds. Uh, and uh, some who've devoted their entire lives to national security in our industry are today, rhetorically at least, asking who won the Cold War. Uh, of course, the answer to that is that everyone who has a passion for freedom uh, won the Cold War. And those who served in the defense industry, and I'm proud to have been one of them, uh, I think takes a uh, particular degree of satisfaction in what's been accomplished. Uh, General Schwarzkopf in his book uh, relates an interesting comment by the Saudi General Khalid who said that if the world is only going to have one superpower, thank God it is the United States of America. Probably a pretty good reflection of the situation because today America really is the only full service superpower, an expression that Ken Edelman and I used in our book, uh, in the sense that America is the only superpower that is an economic superpower, it's a military superpower, it's a cultural superpower, and it's a humanitarian superpower. On the other hand, uh, hard-earned experience of the past suggests that there's some merit to Margaret Thatcher's comments uh, where she remarked that uh, the ice is most dangerous when it's breaking up. And a survey of our globe today is not particularly reassuring in that regard. Uh, whether one looks at Bosnia or Somalia or North Korea or Iraq or Iran or Azerbaijan or Armenia or Cambodia or Sudan or Haiti or Libya or Lebanon or any of a number of others. Jane's Defense Weekly recently uh, pointed to 27 shooting wars that are going on around our globe at the present time. And yet it poses for us this very difficult choice. On the one hand, uh, how as human beings can we stand to, st uh, stand to watch the suffering that's going on, to just stand aside? But on the other hand, uh, uh, there's an impracticality of letting ourselves become uh, 911 America. And it's a dilemma that uh, we need to work our way through. The American defense industry, of course, also needs to recognize that the world no longer pivots on this balance of two superpowers. In fact, uh, uh, this form of dreadful stability uh, uh, and its absence now uh, suggests that we may have worked all these years simply to make the world safe for small wars. And uh, that's a bit of an irony in all this. And of course, a small war is small only to those people who aren't involved in it. Uh, the ironies in today's situation as it affects our industry and our, our, our nation are, are great. As you read the newspapers, uh, if you kind of stand back and uh, you keep running across these things that are so startling, uh, uh, one that strikes me is that one of the principal differences today uh, between the former Warsaw Pact nations and the United States 
is that the United States has a legal communist party. Now, who would have thought that? Uh, or when I was last in Moscow, uh, the line outside of Lenin's tomb was far shorter than the lines outside of McDonald's hamburger stand. Uh, or the one that particularly intrigues me uh, comes from a politician I ran across uh, in what was then Leningrad. And uh, he was very interested in our political process and our elections. Well, it turned out that uh, he was very distraught. He had just run for re-election unopposed and lost. <laughs> so seemingly we're asked, like the Red Queen and Alice in Wonderland, to believe three impossible things before breakfast each morning. And I might say that that's occurred in my own life because just recently I had the occasion to sign a letter to the Secretary of State asking permission for our company to upgrade uh, MiG-21 fighters uh, for some of our allies who had fallen heir to them uh, at the end of the Cold War. I never could have imagined I would be doing such a thing. The uh, the problem, of course, is that in addition to defense conversion and defense spending and maintaining a reasonable industrial base, uh, we face a lot of global problems that have uh, nothing to do with national security, that go all the way from education uh, to energy, uh, from crime to poverty to health care to the environment and so on. And of course, the solution offered by many to those problems is simply cut the defense budget further. Uh, in fact, the New York Times uh, the editorial proposed that very recently, uh, just a few days before the Washington Post in an editorial said we should risk, uh, it's worth risking war in Korea uh, to resolve the circumstance that we face there today. Uh, certainly to keep cutting defense budget, the defense budget is one possibility. If we're to do that, we should have a strategy to go with it uh, that relates to what it is we want to accomplish. Uh, I think some uh, view the defense budget, uh, some of the skeptics, uh, a little bit like the fellow who had a boss uh, for whom he didn't much care. One day the boss came to work and announced he was going to lose five pounds a day, and the workers were all ecstatic because they figured in just nine months they'd be rid of him altogether. <laughs> uh, that's uh, a little bit uh, the problem we face in defense because today that if you cut uh, defense spending to pay for the growth, just the growth in non-defense federal spending, it would turn out that the whole defense budget is gone in just eight years, and then what? Well, there are a couple of tough questions, uh, and I'd like to take them head on. One question is, should we keep a defense industry alive uh, because of the large number of jobs it provides? My answer to that would be a resounding no. I think that the only justification for our defense industry is to meet the needs of national security. That's the only uh, self-sufficient reason. Secondly, uh, do we owe former defense workers some uh, sort of special consideration? For example, transitional jobs or retraining or special unemployment benefits or something like that? My answer again is no. Uh, I think we owe former defense workers exactly what we owe all other uh, workers in America namely the opportunity to earn a living at some useful pursuit. The third question I'd like to raise would be, uh, should we treat the defense industry differently from other industries uh, when the immediate demand for its products disappears? In this case, I think the answer uh, is yes, because I do think the defense industry is different from the buggy whip or the steam engine or the gas lamp industries. And it's different uh, to whatever extent we might want to preserve a, uh, uh, a capability to expand our military capacity at some time in the future. So uh, whatever may be our beliefs about the defense industry, its past contributions or its present needs, uh, I do have a concern that we're, building a, we're seeing a new phenomenon taking place in America for the first time where we're building a hollow defense industry. Today, the defense industry operates at about 60% capacity, uh, and the trend is downward. Uh, the companies in the industry sell at a 44% discount to the average for the market, and uh, we're at the point now where we have one company uh, that builds submarines, and that may be heading towards zero. 
we have one company that builds tanks, that may be heading towards zero, and so on. In most commercial businesses I've been familiar with, to have your market drop 10 or 15 points percent in a few years is viewed as uh, uh, a catastrophic event. In the defense industry, we've seen the procurement budget, which is the main source of support for this industry, we've seen it drop by 67 percent in real purchasing power in the, the last half dozen years. Uh, so we're seeing uh, a significant change. This, of course, contrasts with the situation uh, in World War II when, for example, this same industry with a third of the gross domestic product that exists today, that same industry built a, a tactical aircraft every 10 minutes, day and night, if you can imagine that, 24 hours a day, at the same time was building a tank every 26 minutes, an artillery piece every six minutes, and a military truck every minute. The record time then for building these large liberty ships, you'll recall, uh, large ocean-going vessels, from the time they laid the keel till it went down uh, the gangways, uh, was four days to build one of those. Uh, I can assure you we couldn't do that with today's rules. This is the uh, third major defense drawdown I've seen in my career, but this one is much more fundamental. Uh, I would describe the changes as tectonic. Uh, the reductions at the end of World War II were deeper in the terms of the change in percent of gross domestic product. But uh, defense restructuring at that time was more a matter of reconversion. Companies that prior to the war went into the defense base went back to doing what they were doing before the war. And they did it in a period of enormous build up, uh, pent up demand for goods and services. Following the Korean and Vietnamese wars, there were big cutbacks in manpower that had been added to fight the wars. And also there, of course, was an end to producing things that what are called consumables, uh, fuel, ammunition, and so on, used during those wars. Uh, this time, there's a rather major change in the basic fiber of the defense industrial base. And part of the reason for that has to do with uh, the, uh, the cost trends in military products, and this is a major concern to our industry and our military, and should be to our nation. Uh, some years ago, in 1966, I developed uh, one of my first so-called Augustine's Laws, and in it uh, I made a graph of the cost, the unit cost, what's each airplane cost, of U.S. combat aircraft plotted against the year that aircraft first went into use. And if you plot it on the right kind of paper, you get a very straight line that starts out with the Wright Brothers airplane and goes out through all the modern aircraft today. It's, it's very predictable. It goes up a factor of four every 10 years, no matter what, and very close to that. Uh, I extrapolated that curve, and I also extrapolated the defense budget for the entire history of the aviation industry. And you find an astonishing thing occurs. The thing that occurs is in uh, the year 2054, on June 22nd, the entire defense budget will buy only one airplane. And this is not imaginary data. This is factual data. And it's been true ever since the Wright Brothers Model B. Now, some people may uh, say that I've extrapolated too far. I would remind you I come from uh, one of your sister cities uh, down the road where we have economists who extrapolate based on one data point. So uh, <laughs> what this means, though, is that the defense budget now, we're buying about 100 airplanes a year. And just a couple of years ago, we had 11 manufacturers of uh, military aircraft. Well, even if the defense budget in dollars doesn't change, in the limiting case, it doesn't make sense having 11 manufacturers to build one airplane a year. Doesn't make much more sense to have 11 manufacturers build 100 a year. And so even though the defense budget uh, is at about the level it's been uh, at the low points between wars in the past, uh, it's a bigger challenge to our industry because the individual products tend to be more costly. And uh, that's part of the cause of the, the change. I, this raises uh, a question uh, about what can be done to convert this industry so that we preserve a viable defense industrial base, we preserve as many jobs as we can, and we seek to uh, uh, apply defense technology to the civilian marketplace. 
Before I talk about that, I'd like to take just a minute or two to talk about uh, the situation as the former Soviet Union tries to do this. Uh, they have one advantage, and that is that in the commercial marketplace in their countries, there are no established competitors. Whereas in this country, of course, if one should happen to come up with a new way to build refrigerators, uh, it turns out there are already a lot of people who know how to build refrigerators very well. On the other hand, they have a major disadvantage in Russia, and that is that they have no background whatsoever in terms of operating in a market economy. And uh, uh, as they try to convert from swords to plowshares, uh, they really lack uh, the financial underpinning, the know-how to compete in the free market. It's ironic that uh, under Gorbachev, the first attempt to convert the, the Soviet defense industry uh, went along the following lines, or to convert their, their defense-oriented economy, let me say, where some cities in the Soviet Union, 90% uh, of the economy was defense-related. Uh, the first attempt he made was to say, since the only thing that seemed to work in, in the Soviet Union was their defense industry, they put the defense industry in charge of everything. Well, you can imagine how that worked. Uh, they had a uh, rocket propellant plant, for example, that made some rather suspicious tasting champagne. <laughs> uh, my favorite example, though, was a, uh, a missile plant that went into the business of making uh, sausage manufacturing machines. Now, I've likened that to trying to run the sausage machine backward and produce pigs. <laughs> Uh, that, of course, didn't work. Uh, the second attempt uh, was a little bit different, which was to put together a national inventory with a grand catalog, catalog of all the needs of consumers in Russia, Soviet, then the Soviet Union, and of all the factories and all the machines uh, that could produce to satisfy those needs. This was sort of a centralized decentralization, if you will, and it worked uh, about as well as that oxymoron would suggest, too. Next came the sink or sim, swim school of defense conversion in uh, the Soviet Union and Russia. That was one where various factory managers were simply anointed as CEOs and told to go compete in the commercial marketplace. And in spite of what CEOs like to have people believe, uh, it turns out that CEOs do have people who help them. They have people uh, in marketing departments, treasury departments, shipping departments, research departments, uh, distribution departments, advertising departments, and these poor souls who had been running factories didn't have any of that. I visited uh, one such individual, a very talented individual, uh, who was responsible, had been responsible for a factory, who was now a CEO of a business that had been set out on its own in one of the Eastern European countries. And I asked him uh, who was his principal customer, and he asked uh, what I meant. Uh, I asked, said, uh, well, where do your products go? Who takes your products? And he said, oh, he said, uh, every Thursday a, a, a freight car comes to the loading dock <laughs> behind the plant. We load them in the freight car. And I thought for a moment, and I said, uh, well, what would happen if one Thursday that freight car didn't show up? And uh, he said, I think a lot about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he was learning. The secret weapon they have may be uh, indicated by a comment of an of a acquaintance of mine in, in Moscow who I was going through much this same discussion with, and candidly, I was not very optimistic about their prospects uh, for defense conversion. And uh, finally, uh, he said to me, said, uh, you forget, Mr. Augustine, that we are very good at suffering. And uh, that may be their, their secret, because certainly they have evidence to a great capacity for enduring, and I suspect they're going to be very sorely tested once again to a far greater extent than our industry. Uh, I might also mention in passing that in recent trips to uh, Russia, I have found a growing resentment for the United States and uh, the promises we've been making for many years to help them in their conversion. Uh, they have a, a growing belief, I think, uh, that, uh, put it in the vernacular, we're all talk and no action. And uh, I think that that could backfire us, uh, backfire on us rather seriously. Well, 
Let me turn then to the U.S. situation, because if the Russian one is intractable, uh, the U.S. one uh, would seem to be uh, less difficult. In the U.S., I think we have but four options for defense conversion, and uh, basically those are to liquidate, consolidate, diversify, or to evaporate. Uh, let me start with the last one, which is of no particular interest uh, uh, to me, but uh, <laughs> Uh, the evaporate option uh, is uh, basically the one where uh, uh, you continue doing what you've been doing all along. I've also called it the muddle of the road option. It's the hunker down option. It's the uh, option that's supported by uh, uh, the CEOs who think that Ronald Reagan will be reelected any day. But uh, does not particularly appear promising. It's kind of the same strategy that, that you may have heard years ago. There was a farmer from Iowa who won a, a lottery for a million dollars back when that was a big deal in lotteries. And uh, a reporter had asked him what he was going to do with the money. And he said, uh, well, I think I'll just go back to farm until it's all gone. And, uh, <laughs> that's the evaporate option. The diversify option is the canonical solution for our industry in past down cycles. The answer was to get as far away from defense as fast as you can. Uh, during that time, our industry tried everything from building buses and canoes to banjos, and we even invented a tractor in our industry that would replace the water buffalo out in Southeast Asia. Uh, we invented almost everything that could be imagined and some things like that that probably shouldn't have been imagined. And I've always characterized our industry's record as being unblemished by success. Uh, Renz Caparelli, the uh, CEO of Grumman, uh, recently was asked why his company doesn't invest more in diversification. And his answer was, we've already watched that movie once. Uh, he might have added that they should have shown it backwards so it would have had a happy ending. Uh, why is it that rocket scientists can't sell toothpaste? Well, it's exactly the same reason that toothpaste manufacturers probably can't make rockets. Uh, as the, remember Professor Harold Hill in the Broadway show Music Man that said the problem, you know, he, he doesn't know the territory was the comment. Well, we don't know the territory. Now, there's some great examples where we can go into closely related markets to businesses we understand, and we're doing that. Uh, but when you get too far afield, uh, my experience and our industry's experience has been you get in big trouble very quickly. Uh, as I said, we have a lot of people, particularly in the academic world and the media, that encourage us to, uh, all we've got to do is just go into new businesses. Sounds very easy, but it's a little bit, uh, reminds me of the deep sea diver who on his intercom line one day received a message, uh, come up at once, we're sinking. <laughs> But there are examples of conversion that are important. Our company, you may have seen a newspaper article yesterday about one that we're very proud of where we've taken a, a computer that was designed to go in the nose of a missile and some algorithm software that were to go in the nose of the missile and were to be used for a missile to tell the difference between a tank and a truck and a cow and a bridge and so on. And uh, we're using that same equipment modified to read fingerprints very quickly, where we think we can go through uh, 20 or 30 million fingerprints in 10 or 15 minutes and identify individuals. And this could have uh, some very significant uh, impacts in, in fighting crime. We could also use the same basic technology to read mammograms very quickly and very accurately and very cheaply. And so there are a lot of promising applications. But if you add them all together, it uh, turns out we can't invent fast enough to offset the ability to cut the defense budget. It's much easier to cut the budget. The uh, uh, next step uh, is the liquidate option, which uh, in my mind uh, is the one that is the best short-term option. It's clearly the favorite option by Wall Street. The liquidate option says you stop, to, stop investing in R&D. You stop investing in productivity. Uh, you milk your business for cash, and uh, uh, basically the business goes away. 
And the only problem with that is when you're done, you don't have a defense industrial base. So uh, I don't want to be a part of that one. And that leaves us, at least for our company, only one viable option, and that's the option of consolidating. And in that one, we're going to take a couple companies with half full factories or a third full factories and put them together and produce one company with a full factory. It's painful and it's risky, but it does work. And it's based on the arithmetic that we've derived at Martin Marietta for such consolidation, which says that when it comes to costs, one plus one has to equal no more than one and a half. And when it comes to margin, market synergy, one plus one has to equal at least three. And we're setting out to do that. And before I stop on this part of the subject, uh, let me just say that the, there's one other option that I hadn't thought of, which is clearly the most imaginative approach uh, for improving the efficiency of the defense industry I've yet seen. It comes from uh, the Northrop Corporation. And, uh, the uh, CEO of the Northrop was quoted in USA Today, and I will read this exactly as it appeared because I, I want to do justice to, uh, to my friend Kent Cressa there. It says that CEO Kent Cressa said Northrop will continue to sell non-productive assets. Last year it sold its headquarters in Los Angeles. <laughs> That is a very daring approach, in my opinion. But moving along quickly, I think we'd prefer not to pursue that. As we consolidate the industry, it's important we maintain a competitive base. If we get below a couple companies in each product line, I think the country loses something uh, very important. Uh, and there's a danger uh, if you don't consolidate, you keep so many companies that are so weak uh, that they become irrational and they become dangerous because their lives are in jeopardy every day. I have a law instantly that applies to those companies. It's called the law of the cross-eyed discus thrower. Uh, they seldom win any gold, but they sure do keep the crowd on its toes. <laughs> and I hate to compete with them. Well, in my mind, our industry has only one choice. Uh, that is to uh, grow in the closely related markets and to consolidate for efficiency, and our company is off doing that. Uh, I also believe that uh, in 1989, the world didn't suddenly become a safe place, and I think that probably George Washington in his address to Congress was correct when he said that to be prepared for war is the most effectual means of preserving the peace. The decisions that we make today with regard to the defense industrial base won't really much affect how we deal with Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi or, uh, or uh, Ashami Rasanjani or many of the others around the world today. Uh, the decisions that affect them were made in the 1970s. What we decide today will uh, determine our ability to deal with challenges in the 21st century. Uh, those are very difficult challenges to predict, and that suggests a degree of caution and circumspection as we uh, shape our defense budget in the years ahead. Uh, General Schwarzkopf, uh, in his book, wrote that uh, if someone had asked me on the day I graduated from West Point where I would fight for my country during my years of service, I'm not sure what I would have said, but I'm damn sure I would not have said Vietnam, Grenada, and Iraq. And that's the challenge that we, of course, face as our country tries to decide what is a rational defense policy, and as those of us uh, who deal with the defense industry and have a great responsibility there try to deal with the future of our organizations. So let me close uh, uh, my prepared remarks by thanking you very much for your uh, attention and for giving me the chance to share my views on a subject that uh, I think is very important, not just to our company and our industry, but to our country. Thank you. The, uh, the question is, I believe, would you uh, prioritize the various threats which our civilization faces and uh, uh, specifically and most importantly rank the military threats within that uh, set? Sure. I, uh, I can't speak for our industry in that regard, but I'll try to answer the question uh, for myself. Uh, clearly, America faces, as I suggested, many, many, I think, very important problems, and I listed some and you listed some as well. Uh, they're all problems that I think we need to deal with. I think 
Equally, though, we need to deal with the threats of an international nature. Uh, I think it's not also not a choice of do we uh, deal with the threat of a nuclear weapon in North Korea, or do we not have education in America, or do we let crime become rampant uh, and not deal uh, uh, with potential military threats elsewhere in the world, uh, for example, such as we saw in the Persian Gulf not so long ago. Uh, I think America can afford a reasonable level of defense spending and at the same time do these other things as well. Today, the amount of money that's spent on defense is about equal to what we spend on debt, interest on the national debt. It's about a fourth of what we spend on health care today. Uh, put in other terms, uh, uh, America spends on defense today about what we spend on pizza and alcoholic beverages. We spend about as much on our army as we spend on tobacco and tobacco products. And uh, uh, there are many other examples of that type. So I would agree with you, those other things are very important projects and uh, concerns. And in fact, I spend a good deal of my personal time uh, dealing with a couple of the issues you cited, education being one, that uh, concern me a great deal. But I don't think that one can say, uh, well, we'll forget about national security and we'll spend everything on education or what have you. I think we've got to deal with all those problems, and I think we can. I think we can afford to. The question is, uh, what do you think should be done about uh, uh, intrusions into our domestic order, whether it be from spies or whether it be from a Russian mafia or some analogous organization? I think the, the principal concern that I, I would have in that regard would be not so much intrusions domestically, but what is happening to the Russian scientists uh, who have been building nuclear weapons uh, much of their lives? Today they're being paid about $30 a month uh, as senior engineers in Russia. And whether or not some of those individuals might be tempted to go elsewhere to practice their trade. And that worries me a very great deal, that, that kind of a circumstance. My own belief is that people like Ames are anomalies. They occur uh, from time to time. You try to prevent it. Uh, I don't think there are fortunately very many of them out there. Uh, so I, I, my inclination is to, uh, to be more concerned about what's happening uh, uh, in countries such as uh, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea uh, rather than a domestic concern at this point. The, um there are a couple of questions, perhaps, but one, would you uh, comment on appropriate strategies for the new world uh, in which we find ourselves, and specifically comment on, on whether there are low-cost approaches? It's a good question, and uh, uh, to some degree, uh, the decision has been made to, uh, to go to a, a, a less advanced technology in terms of uh, our approaches. That's not without risk. Today, America's army, you may be surprised to know, is the eighth largest in the world, tied for eighth with Pakistan. Uh, and we have said we will make up for this uh, with technology. But at the same time, today, the amount of money we're investing in technology will permit us to modernize our forces on a rate that says every item of equipment has to last an average of 54 years. That's how long the average item of equipment the military has, whether it's an airplane, an F-14, or whatever. And I think you would agree with me that 54 years is a very long time for, uh, for anything to last. But there are hopes, I think, for uh, uh, reducing costs uh, in that regard. And I think we, we uh, will see more and more of that. Is it possible to, uh, to monitor uh, spending in the national security area to ensure uh, efficiency? You know, I, w I wish I could answer that in a more positive sense. Uh, uh, candidly, there is great inefficiency in the way our defense program is conducted. Uh, on the other hand, I deal with uh, many other departments in government, and I must say the Defense Department is probably as good as any of them. Uh, candidly, there is just great inefficiency in government, and uh, I wish that weren't the case. Today, we have an opportunity, I think, and that we have a Secretary of Defense that spent much of his life studying how do you run an organization efficiently. And the Defense Department in particular. So I think if there was ever hope to deal with this, uh, it's today. There, in the Congress right right now, there's a procurement reform by, uh, bill uh, being debated that is just the first step in what's needed, but it's a, it's a first step. So uh, I'm sorry that I have to agree with you that the system is quite inefficient. 
perhaps no one, nowhere near as bad as the media would portray it. Uh, and it's often the case, uh, uh, most of the horror stories you've read about, and I've researched most of them, uh, there is another side to virtually every one of those stories that uh, you never are told. But uh, putting all that aside, uh, from one who spent his life inside uh, this sector, uh, it is not an efficient sector. It does need improvement. And there are some signs today that we might be willing to do it. But let me hasten to add, in terms of uh, efficiency, it's probably not much different from most of the government. And in terms of honesty and integrity, it's a ton better than you read in the newspapers, and it's better than most of the commercial businesses I live in. And that might come as a surprise to most people. Is there an organized national effort to uh, transform military technology or technology in the national security area to various kinds of peaceful means. And the specific example that which started the question was, for example, uh, dealing with the millions of mines which are scattered around the world in various places. Could I Sir? commend your summary to say, the first question is, what is needed in this endeavor? And then look to where we can find the solution out of the military complex, rather than we got a military complex, how can we sell it? The, the emphasis in the uh, uh, follow-up was to identify the variety of peaceful needs which are there and then ask the question, uh, how does military-derived technology help or how might it help? Actually, there is uh, an interesting program in that regard uh, that's taking place now. It's called the uh, TRP, I think it's called, Technology Reinvestment Program. And it's a program whereby some money has been set aside uh, for companies either in the defense fields or not in the defense fields to go out and find problems that need to be solved, whether it's to uh, uh, go to help with computerized educational systems, uh, whether it's to help find mines, whether it's to in interdict drugs or something like that. And companies can then make proposals uh, to receive a money, and it's, it's a sharing, the company has to match the, the funds that are received to take those technologies and apply them uh, to uh, commercial deeds. And uh, I was fascinated to see the interest in this. Uh, the first round of these took place, of these awards took place last year, and uh, they had like 3,000 proposals, and each proposal had an average of four companies involved in it, so it was like 12,000 companies. Uh, there were repeats in there some, but huge uh, interest in that kind of thing. And uh, it's now in its first year, and so there are no great victories to cite yet. But uh, uh, exactly what you cited, uh, there is effort along those lines. The, uh, the question is whether Martin Marietta Cor Corporation is uh, working on a vision for the 21st century, and the image is whether you uh, lock people up in a room to, to find them. <laughs> I, I feel a little bit like uh, when I was working in the Pentagon and somebody assured me that there was absolutely no evidence that the enemy had successfully used camouflage against us. And uh, <laughs> if you think about that, <laughs> I don't know how to answer a secret project, Mr. Park, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that we have any secret projects, particularly in that regard, but we do have a lot of projects. Uh, uh, looking at, uh, at applications uh, for the times ahead. And our company is actually, uh, maybe some numbers are the easiest way to cite that. Uh, we've gone now from where the company was almost entirely defense related to where today uh, we're 36 percent uh, non-defense and growing. I would expect we'll be half non-defense uh, in not too many years. And, uh, but we're doing that. We're not trying to get out of the defense business. Uh, we happen to think defense is a, a very important, uh, important subject. But uh, we are pursuing ideas that go all the way from uh, we're one of the largest environmental cleanup uh, companies in America. We, I mentioned uh, some of the medical uh, devices we're working on. Uh, we uh, uh, are applying new telecommunications technology. We build. Um, many of the world's communication spacecraft. We build satellites that uh, predict the weather, predict hurricanes. Uh, when you turn your TV on at night and see the weather map, that's made by uh, Martin Marietta uh, spacecraft, that map. So there are, there are many such examples. Uh, 
uh, that one could cite. One that intrigues me uh, uh, is that uh, we have been taking some of the technology we use in training simulators, used to train pilots to fly, uh, and there's some just amazing technology there. We have an agreement with Sega of Japan to put that technology into arcade and video games. So if, if you think your kids and grandkids are spending a lot of money today, wait till you see what uh, we've got there. <laughs> What should either the American government or American industry um, do to help uh, the former Soviet Union that it's not already doing? Yeah, I would like to think that uh, private industry could do a lot, uh, but I'm afraid I, I can't make that claim. Uh, the thing that is most obvious that U.S. companies could do would be to form partnerships and invest in, in, uh, in the former Soviet Union republics. Uh, but the uh, companies uh, such as ours also have a responsibility to our shareholders. And given that fact, uh, we have to make cold, hard business decisions as to whether it's good business or not. And uh, although our company has some agreements with companies in Russia, uh, they're very small compared with the, the scope of the problem that's faced in, uh, in Russia and Ukraine and other countries there. Uh, our government, on the other hand, I think can do more. And uh, our government talked for a long time about providing some financial assistance for conversion. Our government's been very slow in coming forth with that. And the people in uh, Russia resent that. Uh, at least they tell me they do, and I think they do. Uh, it, it's not as easy as it might sound, though, because when you've just laid off a million uh, people in the U.S., uh, for to have the U.S. Congress sending money to create jobs in Russia, uh, is not a great way to get reelected, and uh, and with some good reason, with some good reason. So uh, I think it's another one of these things where a balanced approach is in order. I do think we need to help uh, Russia make sure it stays on its feet, and Ukraine, and Kazakhstan, and others. But uh, also the problem is bigger than we alone can handle. The Russians are going to have to find a way to solve much of that themselves. It's it's just too big for even for the United States to deal with. Would you comment on the defense uh, industry's position on the sale of arms overseas? Yeah, once again, let me just give my own view rather than the industry's view, because I, I really can't speak for the industry. But my own view is that you should never confuse selling uh, military equipment overseas with selling soap or toothpaste overseas. Uh, the latter is a business issue. The former is an issue of national policy. And I think no company uh, should sell anything overseas in the, of a military nature unless uh, it's uh, approved uh, by the government policymakers. Uh, our government may decide it's not in our interest to uh, arm our allies. And uh, in that case, companies in this country should not, and most responsible companies do not, uh, sell anything abroad. If, on the other hand, our government decides it is in the interest of the United States to arm one of our allies, for example, Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or South Korea, uh, then uh, I think in that case it is appropriate for U.S. companies such as ourselves complying with that national policy to provide equipment uh, overseas. But uh, my basic answer to your question is that it's really an issue of national policy. It's, not, it's clearly not a business issue. There are two uh, easy questions. The, uh, the, uh, the, the first is, will you explain the, the ending of the Cold War and the victory, if it was that, over communism, um, commenting upon the alternative theses of whether there was a strategy which was important or whether it was inevitably within the context that the, uh, it ended. That's your, your first question. <laughs> and, and the second one is, would, would you uh, uh, explain the uh, elements in the uh, global context, such as uh, population problems, which uh, might determine our future, uh, might determine future problems and hence uh, suggest needed uh, resolutions? And I think you have about uh, three or four minutes for that. I think you have me in postgraduate school now <laughs> trying to answer these questions. They're getting harder. I, I suspect as viewed through the eyes of a, uh, of a, of a good communist, if there's such a thing, uh, they would probably say they've seen an inverse domino theory where uh, 
Uh, we saw the Berlin Wall fall, the Warsaw collapse. Pact collapsed, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, and now we're seeing breakups of the states, uh, threatened breakups of the uh, republics within the Soviet Union. And so uh, the domino theory, uh, it may have worked, but it worked in the opposite direction to what we all worried about, to our great good fortune it did. Uh, I would share your view, I think it's your view, uh, it would be mine, that uh, it, the thing that really took communism down was the uh, the information revolution uh, and the failure of their economy, and the two were not unconnected. Uh, I one time spoke was speaking with the president of Turkey, and he commented that the thing that, in his view, uh, destroyed communism was CNN. And uh, it could well be right, because uh, it's very hard to mislead people when they can find out what's going on all around the world. It, faxes, videotapes, uh, CNN, uh, uh, the information revolution had a major impact uh, in what happened in those nations. And uh, let's see, I think I've forgotten the rest of the questions. <laughs> Maybe it's this as well. <laughs> At least I've forgotten the rest of the answer. <laughs> yeah. The question is, how can uh, business and industry serve the nation by maintaining a technological foundation uh, while confronting very rapid economic change? Unfortunately, most of the incentives uh, in our country today are to uh, do things that are just the opposite from investing in technology. Investments in technology tend to pay off in 10, 15 years, and we have a marketplace that's interested in next quarter. Uh, the average shareholder of a company in our industry uh, stays with us two years, so on the average we turn over our entire ownership every two years. And it's tough to invest in 10-year R&D products, projects, uh, when the, your owners expect to pay off within two years. So I think the main thing our industry has to do, or industry in general, is have the courage to continue to invest in R&D in spite of the pressures in the market not to do that. And if I think if we continue to invest and for the particular industry, the part of our company, the two-thirds of our company roughly that deals with defense issues, I think in the environment we're in today, the thing to do is take big risks, seek big breakthroughs, seek big gains. Uh, don't look for the routine 10 percent business as usual improvements. I think there's not enough money to go around to do that. So uh, I, I think it's time to uh, uh, really push the edges of the envelope, so to speak. Well, for an evening which has been indeed profoundly informative, I think, and uh, certainly uh, expressed in, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of public spiritedness and, and great good humor, we thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.